So now I want to turn things over to Peggy Simonson. Peggy's been a volunteer with Citizens for Conservation for 16 years. She's a former president of CFC, and she continues to serve on the board of directors. Peggy is currently chair of CFC's Community Education Committee. Peggy? Thanks, Liz. Welcome to all of you joining us tonight. We have a wonderful program for you on invasive plants. Uh, we've done uh, these programs in the past, but uh, I think Matt's going to have real current information for us. But first, I'd like to give you just a little bit of background about Chicago Living Corridors. We started a few years ago uh, with the mission of focusing on property and private ownership, particularly in the Chicago area. Uh, most of the, as you know, most of the ownership is private and uh, we do cooperate with the publicly owned uh, lands like the forest preserves. Uh, but we're focusing primarily on people's yards, if we can. And the focus then is to map this property that's already been improved habitat. So we get a sense of what's going on in the Chicago area. The map I have here is just a screenshot, but if you go onto the chicagolivingcorridors.org website, you'll see the, uh, the colored dots represent the different organizations that are involved in uh, at the the umbrella organization that Chicago Living Corridors is. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Uh, Matt, would, if you move to the next slide. <clears throat> As I said, in, on, uh, we're an umbrella organization. Uh, we don't have members specifically. I mean, we have, we have organizational members rather than individuals. We encourage individuals to join some of the conservation organizations that are part of Chicago Living Corridors. I am with Chicago uh, Citizens for Conservation, <clears throat> as Liz said, and our program that helps <clears throat> people at home uh, identify invasives and or improve habitat are called Habit Habitat Corridors. <clears throat> the McHenry County Wildflower Prop Preservation and Propagation Committee has a program called A Natural Garden in Your Yard. Uh, the uh, Conservation Foundation, uh, which is headquartered in Naperville, has a program that's pretty widespread in the Chicago area called Conservation at Home, and some of the other organizations are using that program. And then Wild Ones also, there, there's uh, a couple of different Wild Ones chapters that were part of our initial uh, founding members, uh, but then since we were founded, we also have these other organizations that have joined, all with the focus of helping improve habitat in, on private property in individuals' yards. Uh, the ones here that uh, Natural Land Institute, Open Lands, the Forest Preserves, Land Conserva Conservancy of McHenry County all use the Conservation at Home program that the Conservation Foundation started. So let's go to the next slide. Uh, you can uh, take a look at our uh, chicagolivingquarters.org, look at the map, work with it if you live in a particular area, well, you do live in a particular area, look to see which organizations cover uh, or, or represent us in those areas. Uh, as I mentioned, the green dots are, are uh, Citizens for Conservation around the Greater Barrington area, but there's a pretty good coverage all around the Chicago area. And we know that some of you are, are far afield that you're, you're joining us because we're on a webinar. But we do encourage everybody to plant native plants join one of these participating organizations. And if you already have good habitat, you could get your gardens on the map, not by contacting us, but by going through uh, the organization that works in your area. Uh, and we're also always looking for volunteers. We look for uh, help with uh, uh, planning and, and uh, promoting these uh, webinars. But right now we're also looking for a volunteer. We've had the help of one of Stuper for a couple of years now, who's the, the liaison between our speakers and the library and CLC to get everything up set, all set up on the, on the webinar. And so we, we really are looking for another person to help do that when it's stepping down in a bit. And uh, if you have an interest in that or in any of the things, uh, contact us through the website uh, Carol Rice, our president, responds to uh, emails that come in, so you can get some information that way. And as I mentioned, there's all sorts of resources on our on our website, Chicago Living Quarters. In addition to the map, we've got uh, plant lists. There's success, suggestions of what kind of plants to plant in what conditions, uh, and a, a, a number of the seminars that we've done in the past. The webinars are also the the uh, the videos of them are on site. So, and we will, as, as Liz mentioned, we'll be doing that with tonight's webinar. So 
you don't have to take uh, frantic notes. If, if uh, you have a chance, you can just take a, a look back at the program again after we're done. So with that, I would like to now introduce our speaker. We are real pleased to have with us uh, Matt Evans, who is the Managing Ecologist for Woodlands at the Chicago Botanic Garden. He is involved in environmental work through several organizations, focused mostly on community stewardship in the forest preserves. But he'll help us understand the impacts of invasive species and how to restore natural areas to health. He'll provide examples of why certain plant species are undesirable and disruptive to our ecosystem landscape and steps we can take to create a healthier landscape. We'll learn about a few particularly important invasive species and how to deal with them. He'll also show us uh, some comparisons of healthy and unhealthy landscapes, including suburban homes. So we're very pleased to have Matt with us tonight. Matt. Well, thank you, Peggy, Liz, and Gwyneth for organizing, and I'm so glad to be here. Can everybody hear me okay? Great. Awesome. So as Peggy said, um, one of the things that I think is very important in our understanding of invasive species and their impact on the landscape and their impact on us is to, to understand what healthy and non-healthy look like. And so that'll be a big part of our conversation today so that as you drive around tomorrow, go to town and drive around, um, your vision will have been slightly altered and you'll be able to see things both good and things that are opportunities to be a lot better. So we won't read through all these, but tonight we will definitely talk about monocultures and resilience as it relates to biodiversity. We will also go through lots of questions about invasive species and what we can do about them. So let's talk about what healthy and unhealthy landscapes look like where we live. We live in Northeast Illinois, most of us um, on this call. And so um, it's, a, it's important in this story to understand the background context. The background context is that there was not one European or Asian or as we call Eurasian plant here in the uh, not too distant past, uh, about 400, 500 years ago. Um, and then as the main wave of European settlement in our region in the 1830s through the uh, 1900s occurred, we really saw a change to our landscape. So here on the left, we have our pre-settlement landscape, which is a, a GIS layer put together by the Morton Arboretum some years ago and the Illinois Natural History Survey. It's a very helpful tool for understanding the past in Illinois, and uh, we use it a lot in ecological work um, and in work to understand our native plant communities. On the right, we have our current green space in Northeast Illinois. Um, you know, it's, it's really not too bad as cities and metropolitan areas in the, current, uh, in the current world go. We have a lot of open space. We're lucky for that. But does it all look healthy or unhealthy? We'll see. So on this um, pre-settlement map on the left, you can see all that brown or, gray or uh, tan color. That's, that represents prairie. Of course, we're the prairie state. So we have a lot of prairie, or we did. And so... This is what prairie is. This is a real, this is the real thing. This is a remnant that is left at Wolf Road Prairie um, in Westchester, Illinois, um, kind of near 294 in Ogden. And it's a little piece of the world that survived um, European settlement and the development of our area. And it, uh, it has a lot to teach us. So this is an important thing to see. This is healthy. This is a savanna. Uh, with a lot of prairie in it. And that's a pretty typical ecotype or landscape type in our region um, and surely covered most of Illinois in the past for the last 10,000 years since the glaciers were here. Um, this is probably what it looked like. We can't go back and say, so I can't say certainly. But this we know exists in some remnant areas and is a, is a guide uh, for our work as we move to make a healthier landscape. Here we are again, the prairie. Some, of, some days to take photos are the overcast days. They tend to make the colors much better. Here we go, what a oak woodland savanna edge might have looked like uh, and still does here in Cook County, uh, this photo is from. So these are healthy landscapes, they're open. There are flowers and trees, scattered trees. Sometimes in woodlands we'll have more dense trees. 
here you go. Here's a woodland, but still lush, rich. Illinois, Wisconsin, Indiana. We are at the confluence of several biomes in the North American continent. And so plant and species diversity, animals as well, insects, fungi, diversity is higher here because we're at the edges of ranges of a lot of different biomes. And so they all kind of mix here. And so we do have a very rich natural history in Illinois, which I think people are just starting to recognize again. And so here, this is, this is Glencoe after the uh, settlement of Europeans and the institution of grazing, which was actually instituted by the forest preserves of Cook County in this case, and the other forest preserves around. Um, there were a lot of learning curves in our understanding of our landscape. And this is unhealthy. So here's an example of unhealthy. This is in black and white. So of course you can't tell if there are a lot of different flower colors or a lot of different textures and colors in here, which are very rich, but we can see not one young tree. We can see no shrubs. And so this really isn't high quality habitat, although the advent of non-native invasive species had not quite hit its full blown uh, impact quite yet like we are living with today. So this here, we have European buckthorn. European buckthorn has an advantage over American plants in that it keeps its leaves longer in the fall. Here's a picture of the fall. You can see the sugar maple starting to go um, yellow in this photograph and the buckthorn is still green, photosynthesizing, growing. It does this for about four weeks on either side of the growing season. So in spring, it's earlier. And in the fall, it is a later growing species. So it has a longer growing season, which has very much helped it become a pest in our region. So this is the impact of that particular species. And we'll talk more about this, but here we have another example of unhealthy. So while you say, oh yes, our woodlands, they're so full of wood. Well, it depends on what wood and also is it just wood and nothing else? because that could be a good indication that it is unhealthy. And so here we have the result of a European buckthorn invasion where there is nothing but buckthorn growing. And in fact, it starts to kill itself as it gets taller and shade out the smaller ones. It's, um, it's important to also remember that it is not buckthorn's fault. We are not mad at buckthorn, although it can be a motivating way to get some work done. Um, people brought these plants here. For or knowing it or not knowing, this is the result. So here we have a grassland that uh, has changed into just one plant. So this is tall goldenrod late in the year, September. And this is an area that is unhealthy again. So in a healthy landscape, we're looking for richness. We're looking for number of species, age of those species varying. And here, the healthiest thing in this photograph is the people engaging it and seeing it learning about it, and then perhaps doing something about it. So here again, we have our healthy landscape. So this is a good way to start this conversation because it gives you the context. And it, first of all, opens the eyes to what Illinois, Northeast Illinois looks like, or you know, used to look like in more abundance and in a few places still does. So here are woodlands again, rich, lots of sunlight, lots of cover of plants. And you can imagine every root system in there is, is helping infiltrate water into the ground. Water is not running off into backyards and sewer drains from this habitat. So let's talk about what a monoculture is. I'm sure this will be a review for everybody, but we will, we will talk about it in this case in its context of lacking resilience. Because resilience is what we're all about in the 21st century and should be always. So here we have a modern day row crop corn farm. And I wanna start by saying that um, anything negative I say about these farming techniques does not come down on farmers. I think that there are corporate interests at work that are, um, that are making it harder for people to make more sustainable decisions. And so anyway, this is part of a problem. This is a monoculture. And so therefore, if one thing went wrong here, or if one invasive species that likes corn was introduced here, there would be a big problem. Here we have garlic mustard in a woodland of Illinois. This is pretty typical invasion of garlic mustard. If it's let go for a long time, it can also create a monoculture. 
And while more things may survive between this because it's in a woodland rather than being treated with chemicals in a farm, um, it still limits biodiversity and therefore resilience, which we'll talk more about. So European buckthorn, we've seen this photo. This is a not a non-resilient habitat and tall goldenrod again, unhealthy. In this context, tall goldenrod is unhealthy. It is a native plant that is capable of existing in a plant community with other plants of the prairie. But after a significant disturbance, this happens. So the big difference, we see that there are plants of varying ages. Mostly you can see that in the trees, but it's true of all the other plants as well. We also see that there are a variety of blooming plants right now, which is great for the pollinators who have different preferences and the different insects that rely on those and the birds that rely on those insects. So the results of a monoculture, which is what our invasive species typically create, which is again, probably review for most people here, but you probably haven't heard about it spoken uh, in a way that illustrates the lack of resilience of those areas. It's not like that tall goldenrod will always be tall goldenrod or the buckthorn will always be buckthorn, but it will eliminate everything else in its way on its way to changing into whatever it will eventually in maybe centuries, decades. It's hard to say. So with this lack of resilience, we wind up having an uncertain future regarding some of the problems that our landscape can present us. And yes, of course, our landscape can present us with some problems. I've heard more about tornadoes up near the Chicago land area than I ever have uh, in recent years. Every year has been getting hotter for the last 20 years or more. And we have a lot of worries on our mind about our landscape. Um, we have fires and floods. And so understanding what will make our landscapes more resilient is a very important part of our understanding of invasive species because the invasive species have come onto this continent and sort of spread uncontrolled. And sometimes they can exacerbate some of the problems that we see from our changing climate or from our land use uh, decisions. Here's one thing that is a little bit of a downer, low point of the presentation, but we are here. We have arrived at a time in the world where insects have seen such a large decline that we have officially put scientists and others who manage land on red alert. Right now, this is primarily driven by agricultural practices, but it's not like you can get it back once it's gone. So we have a disproportionate impact on our small critters first, um, and this will have cascading effects as we go. And so invasive species, what does this have to do with invasive species? Well, some of them are insects. And so this is an important part of our concern for our landscape, because over the last um, 20 years, we've seen the last 10 years, the emerald ash borer devastate forests that have ash components to them. And that is just an ash component. So the ash isn't the main forest tree or even group like oaks are or maples. And so in the East though, we do have the hemlocks, which are a very important and main group of the forest canopy and forest comp um, composition. We do see impacts where those trees also have an invasive species that negatively impacts them. And if we thought the fires out West were bad with fuel suppression from a hundred years of practicing fuel suppression, we, or fire suppression, we, might have some big problems when it comes to the dead stands of hemlock that are marching north as the climate warms and the woolly um, adelgid um, caterpillar aphid can actually move further north and tolerate climbs a little bit northern than their historic range. So insects, while we have this insect die off for beneficial insects. We also have a lot of problems with moving invasive insects around the world. And this problem is also occurring in other parts of the world, not just North America. So last part of the doom and gloom, so sorry, but it's important to set the stage. We also have a big problem with the loss in birds. And this is mainly due to the fact that there are fewer insects for these birds to eat. Um, even if a bird is a seed eating bird, we see that um, 
all those birds when they're infants have to have caterpillars and sometimes they have to have up to 900 caterpillars a day. And so you might think that that's crazy, but that's the research. And if you're a mom bird or a dad bird, you are, you are trying to find those caterpillars and it's getting harder and harder to find every year. And um, while we're talking about that, we should say that oaks are the species of tree that, um, uh, a group of tree that support many, many species of insect caterpillars and other larvae that are great for birds, for our birds and other wildlife. And so the best thing that we can really do these days, and I'll say this again, don't worry, is plant an oak tree. Um, so ecosystem services and invasive species. This is another part of our of the presentation or talk today that is important, I think, for the general public to understand. We have a lot that we take for granted. We take this for granted because it's never been a problem. And so our regulating, supporting cultural and provisioning services from our ecosystem are in decline at the moment. And what that means is that we're going to have challenges to our food systems. We will have challenges to our nutrient cycling, water, and um, that's one of the biggest things that's probably headed our way in this century, which, um, sorry to keep making it sound like it's a long-term thing, but really it is in our uh, in the context of invasive species and what we can do about them. And so when it comes to our water issues of the future, whatever they might be, um, our ecosystem service of just having water, especially here near the Great Lakes, will be something that we surely will give more thought and attention to. Um, um, so when we talk about our ecosystem services and how they're impacted by invasive species, what we're really talking about is natural hazards, um, we're talking about climate, we're talking about water, we're talking about soil, and that might be relative to most people through food. Um, and, you know, worst case scenario, dust bowl, best case scenario, we have organic, organic and nutrient cycling farming that really um, does present a more sustainable option and future for all of us together. So all of these ecosystem services are impacted by our invasive species mostly because they just eliminate the biodiversity that is that is that makes up our ecosystem services the geology and abiotic portions are also impacted as you've probably un, um, seen the impact of the returning of the wolves at yellowstone it literally rerouted the river again because there were not an overabundant population of deer destroying the root systems of plants that would otherwise hold the river and the river banks in place and so when it's, uh, it might seem like it's distant from the actual impact, the impacts are complex and the connections and network are complex. And so an invasive species is one that affects a habitat or biodiversity negatively. And it usually is a non-native exotic species from somewhere else in the world because it has some traits that allow it to outcompete or otherwise dominate ecosystems where it has found itself landed. And so that's true in North America, it's true in South America, every continent on the planet, tall goldenrod is terrible in Europe and Japan. They don't know what to do about it, or at least they're trying to learn just like we are with our invasive species. So here's one of our shocking examples. If you've been to the East Coast and I was traveling there recently and saw this plant for the first time, this is kudzu. It can grow up to a foot a day and it can grow up to um, 180 feet a year. Mm -hmm. um, because of the growing season. And so this plant um, has taken over this woodland. It has, I'm sure, pulled trees down and completely shaded them out, covering them. This is something that we see on the East Coast as an impact to our ecosystems. And you can imagine that these ecosystems don't function and give us our, grant us our ecosystem services in the same way that they might if they were not covered in kudzu. In our region, it's European buckthorn, and we'll talk about this a little bit more in a few slides. European buckthorn has essentially eliminated the understory, and while the oaks from a generation ago are okay and still producing acorns, none of those acorns can grow underneath European buckthorn. So that does present a serious threat to our biodiversity and to our ecosystem services, which are shade and... Um, forest land um, completeness or intactness that helps to steady water and soil. 
Lesser celandine is a plant that just eliminates spring biodiversity in our woodlands. Um, and this biodiversity is key for our pollinators. So you might say, oh, but there are plenty of flowers there, but they only last a few weeks, maybe one or two weeks. And so by the end of that, there are no flowers anymore because this has outcompeted everything. And so when you see the beautiful buttercups in our forest preserves and waterways, uh, when you drive around in April, remember that now your vision has been checked a little bit. You can, you can say, oh, wait, I know that that's not good, actually, and that maybe there's something that we could do about it. Common reed, Phragmites, and this might be review for a lot of people, but these are, the, these are some of the major ones in our region um, and in our continent, frankly. So common reed, coast to coast, definitely one of those wetland invader, invaders that there are answers for, but has um, significantly disrupted the biodiversity of our wetlands and less so the function. So the, the root systems and the drawing up of water and, and slowing of currents has produced an effect that that does resemble an intact marshland, but it is obviously not biodiverse and supporting the life that it could otherwise be. We have another version of that. They often grow together. This is purple loosestrife. It's beautiful, which is one of those things about the invasive species. Um, and it does provide flowers for pollinators, but this plant eliminates every other plant around it. And why that's important is because some insects rely on a certain species of plant to eat the leaf of when they're in their caterpillar or larval stage. And so by reducing the plant diversity to one, you lose all the insects that would have otherwise needed another plant species. Teasel, this is having a great year this year, which is scary sometimes to look at when you're driving on the highway. But on the highway, this plant is abundant. It was int originally introduced for a number of reasons, one of which was to stabilize highway banks and soils. Uh, now a noxious weed and illegal to distribute or sell or buy. So some of our invasive species, and remember invasive means that it has a negative impact on the landscape or the health of the ecosystem, which usually means a negative impact on biodiversity. And so why would some of our native species be invasive species then? Well, because they have a negative impact on the overall biodiversity. And that's because we have changed our landscape dynamics. No, I'm not saying that we need to burn everything all the time, but I will say that we'll talk about fire for a minute and try to understand it better and how it has an impact, both positive and negative on our landscape. So here's our pre-settlement map again, remember? So now we're looking at the 1830s through the 1860s-ish in our region. Um, and we see that in the red dots, which are circled in their density, um, we have non-fire adapted plant communities. So this is maple, basswood, and um, elm trees, which are the dominant tree types of the east. And so before I had said that we are at the confluence or the edges of many different, or the gathering point of many different biomes, one of those is the eastern woodlands of sugar maple fame. And so we have a bunch of sugar maple groves and areas. As you go into Indiana, it's even more. As you go up into Wisconsin, it's even less. And as you go over to Iowa, it's much less. And so here in Chicago, this was the historic, at least a snapshot of the 1830s of our sugar maple distribution. And so we see that there was not, there were not a ton of areas that had a lot of sugar maple in them. So sugar maple was not one of the dominant type of trees. And sugar maple, importantly, is not a fire adapted species, but the green, the oaks and the hickories are fire adapted. And those woodlands represent much more of our landscape. This is a clue to us investigators that the landscape must have been at least frequent, at least infrequently disturbed by fires or something else that can favor oak hickory and reduce the abundance of sugar maple, elm and basswood. And so in our region, we really do understand a lot better than we used to now that the landscape was burnt frequently. And the story there is important for us to tell these days and understand because it hasn't been told enough. The fires were not just wildfires. Most of these fires were a cultural practice by the communities of indigenous people who lived in our region. And they did that because of their lifestyle and their need for sustenance. 
and other cultural reasons. And so it's important for us to talk about the fact that our landscape was already managed in some way, shape or form. And that is true of every landscape on the planet. And so we have um, a, a history of fire here. And thus our plant communities, which were already adapted to fire because of the fact that they are great plains, grassland um, plants and animals, uh, we have a lot of evidence that when we change our landscape, we can actually, and remove our fire, we can actually do harm to our native biodiversity, which is adapted to that. And so with our open oak woodlands, we have a rich understory full of herbs, sedges, grasses, plants galore. There are about 1700 plants in the Chicago wilderness region, which rivals the Grand Canyon National Park. I'm sure some of you have heard that statistic before, but we live in a rich area of biodiversity and most of our woodlands look like the one on the right. And so why is that? That's because we have allowed sugar maple, which is a native plant, a great tree, one of great cultural and, um, sus and sustenance um, sort of importance. And so why is this bad? Well, it's bad because we've lost lots of biodiversity under the canopy of those sugar maples that have become overabundant in their uh, fireless landscape. And so when we lose the fire, the low intensity fires that keep the sugar maples from growing into the canopy too often, and the oaks and hickories healthy and open grown, and they refresh the, the fires, that is, they refresh the ground layer by removing leaf litter, providing for floral synchron synch uh, synchronized floral displays, which leads to greater pollination and um, many other benefits returning nutrients to the soils as well. So when we lose our fires, we really have changed the landscape a lot as well. It's almost like introducing an invasive species because the species that were here that were fire um, suppressed are now not feeling the, uh, feeling the burn anymore, and they are able to recruit at greater numbers that are unnatural. And so we're seeing unnatural amounts of darkness in our woodlands, especially. And our savannas have almost entirely closed up. And so when we are looking at ground layer diversity in a woodland, this is what we're looking for on the right. And what we're often seeing is what's happening on our left. And again, why does that matter? Well, a lot more water runs off and erodes out of a woodland that is one that looks like the one on our left and the one on our right does gather more water in its roots and provide habitat for insects and wildlife inspiration for people and overall greater landscape health so here's a startling statistic from 2020 um, in 2010 through 2020, they did two different surveys, uh, repeat surveys of the same areas to understand the canopy of trees in our region. And so we have found that over the last, um, over the last 10 years, let's say, European buckthorn represents over a third of the canopy of our region. Oaks, oaks don't even make the 2% cutoff for this graph which you might say is surprising. Wow, I drive by so many humongous oaks all the time. Well, that's one tree or it's a few trees scattered or it's a forest preserve full of you know, other trees, mostly sugar maple and it was ash for a while. Um, but our landscape has been going through a lot of changes and we can now affirmatively say that our oaks are, are pretty imperiled. They don't have a great chance unless we do something. It turns out that European buckthorn is a great menace to our ecosystems. It's not its fault, but it does have its impacts. And we have all these other trees that are also becoming, um, it's hard to say whether or not they're becoming a problem or they're becoming our next canopy, our next ecosystem. We will see as time tells. Um, but right now, oaks don't even make the 2% cutoff. So back to our most important thing that I want to convey to you to do is to plant oaks. And don't plant a single oak if you can help it. I mean, that's still great. But planting one or two or three oaks in a small grove will increase the chance of survival for all of those trees and provide more benefit to everyone from you to the ants and caterpillars that call the oak home and the lichens. And so this is an interesting graph that I'm happy to share with you all. You can 
access this information on the Chicago Region Tree Initiative website, which is through the Morton Arboretum. So here's another case study. Let's talk about why invasive species matter. So this is a case study from near Brookfield Zoo. And there was an old remnant prairie there in 1907. You can see it on the left here. It kind of looks like the photos I've been showing you of the rich prairie landscapes that we have today with lots of diversity, textures. In this, unfortunately, you can't see colors, but you can see there's a young oak in the back and old oaks in the back. It's healthy here. And this photograph was taken from this arrow, from the position of this arrow looking what in this photo would look like northeast. So let's take a look at the next photo. This was over a hundred years later. Um, this prairie's gone uh, and it's just European buckthorn now. And so this is a case study to demonstrate that it can get this bad. It can go from being open grassland habitat, supporting biodiversity that we don't even know everything about yet, to buckthorn, which we know from several studies that nothing on this continent eats. The birds eat the berries because there's nothing else um, or very little else. And it actually does make them sick, and, but it does distribute the seeds all over the landscape. And so buckthorn has been something that we need to put some has been something that we have needed to put some thought into finding an answer to. And now that we do have this answer, it's time to start spreading the word that we can change it and what its impacts have been. So here, another example of our map, we can now see that the entire area here that was labeled prairie is now some kind of woodland with buckthorn underneath it. You better believe that not all those trees are oaks mm -hmm. and that this is a degraded habitat now. Sure, it's okay for prairie to turn into healthy woodland. That used to happen a lot. We know that. Aldo Leopold said that at the edge of the prairie and the woodland, there was a constant tension, both being transformed into the other. It might have been one of the great speciose places on the planet in the, in the past. But now we have been losing our prairies to our buckthorn and our trees. And back to fire for a second. This is a grassland. It needs fire and it needs grazers, but it it needs its historic grazers. It can't just have the 100 deer per square mile that exist in Cook County. It needs more than that. Um, and it needs frequent fire in order to maintain a treeless landscape and the biodiversity of the tall grass prairie. And the tall grass prairie was the mirror image of the Amazon rainforest on the other side of the equator. So we like to say sometimes that the tall grass prairie is the Amazon rainforest, but upside down. But if you really think about it, it also has an above ground component. So that makes it almost even more biodiverse. No one will ever really know. So back to our invasive plants impact on our ecosystem services. So we have all of these buckthorn thickets that have taken over our prairies and woodlands. We've reduced the number of fires on our landscape and their, their impact, their positive impact on the landscape. And we've allowed certain species to start to fill in the holes that perhaps might not be the best species to fill in any holes that we left in our development of this landscape. And so invasive species are reducing our resilience, our biodiversity and our resilience, and they're reducing certain, uh, certain tangible uh, securities that we have as a people on our landscape, such as our, our water quality. They are doing that by making our marshes and our rivers more erodible and more pollutable. Um, they are impacting fish, wildlife habitat. I mean, for 60 years, there weren't a lot of fish in the Chicago River. The, I'm happy to say that the trend is, is heading in the right direction now. But thanks to a lot of good work and understanding of the fact that these are not just waterways, but ecosystems. We have our tree cover being one of our big things that we can't see right now because we still see our majestic oaks and we really love them. And we talk about how we don't need to do anything because we have these trees right now, but they're not reproducing. In our region, it's pretty rare to find a woodland that has three generations of oak trees in it, one of which is at your angle. And so these days there aren't a lot of those um, ecosystems left. And that means that in the future, we won't have our oak trees uh, in the abundance that we have them now, which you say might not matter to you, but in the end, it will uh, be the, the, 
the decline of the mortar that kind of holds our whole ecosystem and landscape together. Um, many things will vanish with the oaks if we uh, don't do something to help them out. And those things are coming up now. So a little bit of doom and gloom, sorry about that, but it is important for context. And removing invasive species is something that you have a lot of power to do. And I'm gonna tell you some more things about that. So there's there are generally a few ways to stop an invasive species from spreading and to get rid of it altogether. So one of those ways is by pulling. Understanding that a weed is only an annual or biennial, meaning that it will live one or two years only and then drop seeds, means that if you pull it before it drops seeds, you can put an end to it pretty quickly. Garlic mustard and the sweet clover species are species with which you can do that. And so clipping, cutting, and painting stumps with some kind of stump killer is the main way to eradicate buckthorn, honeysuckle, and other woody invasive species, which are really some of our worst. So while some might not like commercial herbicides or ways that are chemically, uh, chemically driven to reduce the number of invasive species, this is a hardware store. Um, option called stump out that just has a little paintbrush on the inside of the cap and you just paint on a little bit of the clear liquid onto a stump to make sure that stump doesn't grow back. So that's a main way to get rid of some of our woody species. Um, and then with species that we, um, similar to pulling, the goal of removing a seed head from a species is to make sure that it doesn't set seed and then grow more of it. And so with teasel, that's a good option. Um, that's the one that was planted all over the highways. And so there are seasonal priorities with this work. And while there's invasive, there's a lot of on invasive species in here, you'll also see that I've put in the prescribed fire and I've added a few other things that are related to invasive species management. So in the winter, it's really that time to remove invasive buckthorn and honeysuckle, a few sugar maples from your ward lot every year something like that to bring the light back into our wooded ecosystems. And if it was a prairie, which many of our buckthorn thickets these days between our roads or between your house and your neighbor's house, you know, that used to be prairie, not woodland, but perfectly acceptable to restore it to woodland, of course. Um, so we do this work in the winter because the ground is frozen and the impact to the entire ecosystem is, is minimized at this time of year. So if you are walking around in the snow that's a lot better than walking around in the mud in fall because you could be disturbing root systems of some of the plants that you had just seeded in or plants that have been surviving there and fighting it out against the buckthorn since the dawn of time here. And so by broadcasting native seeds in this scenario where you've removed buckthorn, you can actually reestablish and transform the ecosystem back into something that's a lot healthier, which is a pretty remarkable thing to watch. And you want to broadcast your seed in the winter. All of our seeds need, uh, excuse me, need a 60 to 90 degree or 90 day winter in order to germinate. That's an evolutionary adaptation to our temperate climate where we do have winter. And it basically assures that the seeds will not grow before spring. And so now knowing that we seed all our plants or all our seeds of our native plants when we know they'll get a good long winter. Um, so in the spring, after the snows have melted away, we have our garlic mustard pulling, our herbiciding of lesser celandine, which it is very difficult to eradicate this plant by digging it out. It creates little bulblets or a bulb and then several smaller bulbs that just break off and start a new plant after you've dug it out. If you missed a few, um, it, I've seen it work where people can dig it out. So if you're really averse to any kind of chemical treatment for plant management, organic or natural herbicides, anything, um, you know, digging it out is an option. And then before all of that though, a prescribed fire on a warm day in March is always good for the ecosystem. And so we do that in our region as a general practice of ecosystem maintenance management and for ecosystem health. Here's an example of a healthy place with little baby white oaks in it. Um, so in summer, we, uh, we do treat invasive species before they set seed. That's the main thing that we're doing. You can see me here doing a vegetation survey as well to see how it's going. This is a baseline survey underneath some buckthorn. You can see there are just a few species of plants growing there. 
And in fall, it's uh, back to cutting honeysuckle and buckthorn, uh, the occasional sugar maple, in order to bring some more light back to the ecosystem. Um, prescribed burning when things dry out before the snows. And importantly, seed collecting. And the more of these that you can get, the better and faster an ecosystem will respond. Getting a rich species seed mix and a great abundance of those seeds can often help to make the results a lot better. And so let's talk about spraying herbicide because there is a, um, can you guys still hear me? Yeah? Yep, yeah, we can hear you. Okay, great. I think one of my AirPods died. Sorry about that. So, um, so let's talk about spraying because I know that this is a big topic for people and I would, I just love to be in the position to help answer questions and tell people more about this. So yeah, of course there are horrible ways to do this and there are ways where you don't need to do this. And so when it comes to these top photographs here, um, we have, um, two people spraying herbicide. One of them is, is wearing a short sleeve shirt with no gloves and, uh, eye protection is usually something that we like to see. Um, so this is an example of exactly what not to do. This is terrible practice and I don't support that kind of spraying in any way. And then this on the right with the X on it, this is a person spraying a lawn, which I really don't recommend. I think that that's a terrible waste of a, of a chemical that can be useful or harmful. And in this case is pretty harmful when you're doing lawns like that. Um, and we'll get back to lawns and what you can do in a little bit. So there are these targeted approaches to herbicide use where grass specific or broadleaf specific herbicides, broadleaf meaning not a grass, um, can help to eliminate the risk of killing other things or using too much herbicide or, or, um, or making the appearance that you really are just killing everything because that's often not the case. Sometimes there will be a healthy marsh that got invaded by common reed or purple loosestrife and you want to go and take care of those things while minimizing the impact to other plants and animals in that area. And a lot of herbicides have been designed for uh, to break down when they hit water. They cannot, they denature entirely into their uh, mostly phosphorus, which can be a nutrient addition to our waterways, which, uh, but I wouldn't say that this is a serious addition of phosphorus to our waterways compared to agricultural practices. Um, and then pre-emergent herbicides, I just want to mention them because there are some annual species that will just keep setting seed and setting seed. But And you can use a pre-emergent herbicide, which means you're spraying the ground before that comes up. But with the uh, annual species, you can also, over a few years, remove the seeds from the situation almost entirely. And after a few years, the plant, which relies on its seed, will start to fade away. Um, and there are, these days, organic options, which is great. We love to see the industry have pressure from consumers and other users of these products. I myself have a few of these products that I use in our work. And these are great options um, for peace of mind. And they, they do tend to work pretty well. Um, there are situations in which they are not the better option. Um, but there are nowadays options for everybody's tastes, I think. And so with that, I will sort of close out our spraying section here, but it was important to touch upon. I'm not gonna give a presentation about invasive species management, what they are, how they impact us and what to do about them without mention spraying, even if it's unpopular. I just wanna remind everybody that dandelions are not invasive. This is a species that is not from the United States or North America or the Western hemisphere at all, but it's also not an invasive species. So this is a great example of a species that is what we call naturalized. It has become a part of the plant community. And sure, in a lawn, it does fairly well because there's nothing else competing with it. But a dandelion in a prairie, pretty rare. Pretty rare to see a, a dandelion in a good, high-quality prairie because there's just no room for it. It just doesn't compete. It can't compete with the prairie plants. And so the dandelions are not invasive. Violets, not invasive. Many of them are native. And so what can you do besides you know, treat invasive species through either cutting and treating the stumps and removing the slash or the sticks and trunks. Um, and besides killing the invasive plants, well, you can help by giving them some competition 
that's one thing that I highly support. These plants have been out competing our natives, but the natives haven't had us on their side for all this time. And so perhaps we can tip the scales. And I think that this is a really positive way to solve a lot of problems at once. Starting to plant these native plants, and I know that everybody on this call is pretty familiar with that, definitely the Conservation Foundation and, um, and associates and affiliates. Um, but these native plants help to create connections between habitats that would otherwise be disconnected by miles of suburbs and roads and cities, um, which helps to uh, establish greater ecosystem intactness and complexity, which helps to foster greater resilience. And these native uh, plantings are often very rich in species diversity and therefore support a lot of different insects. And you might say, well, I don't want my yard to have a lot of insects. Well, it does create the insects that eat those insects too. So it balances out pretty well. It's an ecosystem again, instead of just something that had very little uh, biodiversity in it and therefore very little resilience. Um, and these plants oftentimes support themselves. They don't need a lot of help from you except in their establishment year or two. And then after that, their adaptations granted by evolution in this region have, um, have seen them through our droughts and our storms and our winters. And so these don't need a lot of help. Every now and then you might just need to trim them back because they're so happy to be alive in your yard. And so um, I just want to mention that tomorrow there's a pop-up native plant sale at Possibility Place, and I can throw that link in the chat during the question time, um, but that's in Will County. And so that is going to be, um, that's going to be a great opportunity, one of the first of the season to get some native plants for your yard. Um, so natural areas and native plant gardens, well, why don't we make them one and the same? That's, that's one of our uh, or at least uh, tip the scales more toward our native plant gardens being natural areas or our gardens in general. So here we have a beautiful prairie patch in a garden. You can see there's still turf grass between the cars and the plantings underneath the windows of the house, which you can't see in this photograph. There are woodland plants and out in the sun, there are just a couple of circles cut out of the lawn and planted with prairie plants. And so that's a great happy medium between having a lawn and having habitat in your yard or being part of the resilience and solution to some of our ecosystem service problems that we're having and will continue to have as we go forward. Um, and so planting native plants in your yard is something I know that the Conservation Foundation has a ton of resources about, so I won't dwell on too much. But I do want to mention that um, many of us in, in who practice this ecological restoration professionally um, like to make a special point of, of noting that our hedgerows are how our buckthorn and honeysuckle got here and that they are in the Chicago region. For those who didn't know, Chicago was ground zero for European buckthorn on this continent. So it all started here. That's why we have one of the worst problems of it. It's had the longest time to develop here and it has spread though. Um, but as soon as you get south about to um, Ohio or Columbus, you really stop seeing buckthorn, which prefers the northern climes, and you start seeing honeysuckle uh, be more frequent. So I like to remind people that in our grassland region that had lots of savanna in it, uh, we have some of the greatest shrub diversity in the world. And we, um, we still plant our non-native things that we're used to. And so that, that's just a cultural shift problem. And so I think the answer to that is presentations like these. And making sure that the places where you're buying your plants have options for you to plant native shrubs for your hedgerows. And oftentimes they're much more interesting, brilliant and beautiful. And so here on the right, you can see a, probably what looks like maybe some of your backyards. Uh, that's my cousin's backyard. So that's a buckthorn thicket that is up against a lawn, which is supporting very little diversity. Oh, I think I've done it with my AirPods. Can you still hear me? Okay. Yep, we can hear you. Thanks. Great. Sorry about that. Okay, so here is the here's one of the answers to this hedgerow problem, and that is that um, the Morton Arboretum has created a healthy hedges brochure. You can email the Chicago Region Tree Initiative if this was an in person. I would have a bunch with you uh, to hand out to you, but 
Um, this is a guide. I know it's super small, but look at all those different native shrubs you can plant. So that's a great resource for people. And I think these resources didn't exist back in the in 1900 when buckthorn was introduced. And it, it uh, could have made a big difference at the time. So here are some of the reasons that people are interested in their native plants in their yards. Again, I know you're well versed in this if you're someone who keeps up with the Conservation Foundation. Um, but you'll know that our soils in the suburbs of uh, Chicago are not the greatest soils. So if anything, our deep root systems of our native plants can certainly help uh, to improve soil health. Um, I want to point out that it's a myth that uh, carbon sequestration can only be done through planting trees. Now, there's good research to that, that proves, not just suggests, but proves that grasslands sequester a great amount of carbon as well. Truly, nothing is like a forest. That's true. But uh, the root systems, the deep root systems, and the fungal communities of our grasslands underground uh, do sequester large amounts of carbon. And so there are... Um, policies in the works to uh, to benefit homeowners who plant carbon sequestration gardens, kind of. And so here we have, I just like to drive home that in our suburbs, we really do have savanna conditions. And savannas being some of the most biodiverse ecotypes in the world, that's great for biodiversity. This is a wonderful opportunity. And so with our suburbs being scattered trees and homes with lots of sun, some that are really shady, there's certainly a place for every uh, home. There's certainly a plant community for every home that is native to our region. Here we are again with an alternative to a lawn just to show you. Um, and then in this link, I can put this in the chat too, but at the Chicago Botanic Garden, um, some of the scientists received an award to study alternative lawns and uh, different plant compositions for those lawns. So I have a feeling in a few years here, this will become more normal and we'll have a lot of different options for, uh, for real lawns that have biodiversity in them. And so it is, it is good to, to match the plant community to what you have rather than to take what you have and put whatever plant community you want there. Um, and so with that being said, if you're in the desert, desert plants, if you're in the Illinois tall grass prairie, it's savanna, the complex area that is Northeast Illinois, you have a lot of options from woodland to grassland. So what else can you do? Besides removing invasive species and planting their counterparts, the natives to create our uh, ecosystem of the future that we need in harmonious, um, harmonious connection with people. You can also volunteer in the preserves or volunteer at the parks. Wherever you live nearby is probably the best option so that if everybody did it where they live near, the world would be on its way to removing invasive species in most of the corners of all of our neighborhoods and lives. And so volunteering in the preserves, you'll be removing invasive species, collecting and sowing native species, which is actually a very relaxing and fun time, just mostly talking to people, enjoying the landscape and picking seeds. And then protecting some of these plants that are rarer uh, to uh, make sure that they establish in our preserves is also part of what we do in the preserves. Um, and I'm sure so many of you have done that who are on this call. So with that, I hope that I have been able to present invasive species in a way that help you understand this landscape on this slide better. This is Illinois. Much of Illinois does not look like this anymore, but it can. And I think that it will if we all put our minds toward, uh, toward restoring the native plant communities and removing and managing to the extent possible the non-native invasive species that have caused so many problems.